Welcome to the Virtual Leader Advisory Committee Roundtable. And I'm excited to see all of you here today. And as we all know, Leader has been an issue not only for Spark, but also throughout the city. It is my hope that we can develop long-standing solutions in cooperation all involved, and that the solutions that we develop together can be a blueprint for the rest of the city. I would like to take a quick moment to particularly thanks Chris Ignoli from DPW for being here, Patrick Sullivan, Sergeant William Catelier for the Ordinance Squad, uh, Ordinance Flex Squad, Keith O'Connor from uh, Housing Court Enforcement, Solomon Bayman from Di Director of Roca, Joseph Funari, uh, also from Roca, Stephen DeSolette, Building Commissioner, Mark Heaver, Building Commissioner, and uh, or Mayor Dominic Sarno, who sends his regrets that is not able to be here as he is currently directing uh, or is involved in a, sc uh, a school committee meeting. Leader is not only a quality of life issues, but also a health issue. I look I forward to a robust friend. discussion, my friends. And uh, I have appointed, uh, this, is so this is such a new, serious issue uh, that is affecting our quality of life that I created this little leader advisory committee. I have I appointed uh, Erica Swallow, as we all know. Um, she's absolutely great uh, to, to direct uh, and to conduct uh, and chair this committee. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to recognize uh, here on the call today, uh, some of the elected officials that are joining us. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Peter Walsh, Councillor Walsh, welcome ma'am. So it's good to see you. Uh, we also have uh, from, uh, I believe, uh, Rev. Gonzalez's office. Um, uh, who's representing uh, Rev. Gonzalez? Angelica Kaur. Angelica Kaur. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, like Angelica, thank you. Thank you for being here. And also, I would like to make another um, mention that we have a young man, a very hardworking man here, Jay Latori. Uh, Juan Latori, who's also joining us on the call. Uh, welcome. Evening, Councilor. Thank you. No problem. Um, so with much uh, ado, I would like to turn it over to Erica. She's going to give us uh, some of the ground rules for today's meeting. And the purpose of the meeting is to listen. We're going to be listening to everything you say. Uh, the uh, city is going to be listening to everything you say. So as I mentioned before, that we can together develop long-standing solutions to address the little issue through our city. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to look forward to the discussion. Erica, floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Councillor Davila. Uh, so I'll go over the ground rules. Um, first of all, I want to note that this is a recorded session. So if you do not want your likeness, likeness recorded, just turn off your camera. Um, the, the recording will be posted for those who cannot uh, attend this evening to be able to see. Speaking time. Um, please try to keep your comments to three minutes um, and then give time for response and further discussion. That will help us make sure we get everyone's voices heard. Um, how to speak, you can either physically raise your hand or there is a function, uh, and I'm even a, I'm even not even knowing how to do this, maybe Beata can tell us, but there is a function in Zoom where you can digitally raise your hand as well. Both Beata and myself will be looking for that and one of us will call on you to speak. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can, um, in the bottom, you can see the chat. Uh, Beata will be monitoring that and will be able to help you. Uh, she'll also be managing the time, so roughly keeping everyone to around that three-minute speaking time. I want to mention that our, all of our special guests who Councillor Davila um, mentioned, uh, that they are all here taking off time of their evening. We're very grateful for their presence. It means a lot to the committee and to our community that they are taking this time off. Um, so we um, do not, I, I let them all know that they're not uh, required to answer any questions that we may have. They're, they're strictly here to listen, but they are totally welcome to chime in if they so feel like it, if they feel like their comments will be helpful. I'm going to quickly run through that list of people again, because I'm really excited to have everyone. Chris Signoli, Director of DPW. Patrick Sullivan, Director of Parks, Rec, and Building Management. Keith O'Connor, Deputy Director of Housing Code Enforcement. Chad Joseph, Sector H 
Forest Park and East Forest Park C3 Ordnance Flex Squad. And he's even injured and he's on here. Um, Solomon Bayman, Director of Rocco Western Massachusetts. Uh, we have obviously City Councilors um, Catery Walsh. And I've been told that Justin Hurst, he has RSVP. I haven't been able to scroll to see if he's here yet. And obviously our own Ward 6 City Councilor Victor Davila. And once again, Mayor Dominic Sarno sends his regrets, but he did send um, Director Signoli and Director Sullivan um, to be able to make sure that our voices are being heard. So next up, solutions oriented. Um, with that all in mind, if you can keep your comments to definitely pointing out questions, and if you have any um, ideas on solutions, um, feel free to put those forward. You don't have to have those. Um, it's um, our work as the committee to try to um, see what we can present to the city. But if you have ideas, um, please put those forward as well. And if you feel like, um, finally, if you feel like um, the three minutes or the amount of time you got to speak wasn't enough, you can reach out to Councillor Davila or myself. Um, I will put our um, emails in the um, chat box. Um, Victor is vdavila at springfieldcityhall.com. And myself, I'm hi, H-I, at ericaswallow.com. And finally, I'll be taking notes on this uh, secondary screen. So you may be seeing me um, looking this direction a lot. And that's that's uh, because I'm taking thorough notes to make sure um, we translate all this into the rest of our work. With that, we are here to listen. And I will open up for a discussion. The core question of the night, Beata, do you have a question or a comment? Before we start, because there are so many people online, I can't see everyone on the screen. So um, if you are raising your hand and we're not responding, please put a note in the chat. And if you are getting to, uh, I'll try to give everyone a 15 second warning when your three minutes are up. That's perfect. And, and the other thing is when you are not speaking, please put yourself on mute to avoid a lot of, of background noise if you can. And uh, Erica, if you are, if you are, please uh, let me interject real quick. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, Councillor Lavar Click, who just joined us as well. Uh, good evening, Councillor. Thank you for joining us. Love it. Thank you for being here. So uh, we have um, a great group here. Thank you to the community for gathering. And I'll now open it up for discussion. The main question of the night being, what are the litter problems you are seeing in the Forest Park neighborhood? And what solutions, if any, do you have in mind? Jane Hetzel, go for Hello. it. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about trash, um, which is all over the city. Um, and I appreciate the fact that there's a lot of talk about cleaning up and picking up and uh, more picking up. But my main concern is after it's picked up, I don't, want it put back, I don't want it put back down again. So I'm hoping that along with all of the discussions, there is prevention and that there are um, comprehensive anti-litter campaigns throughout the city, including the schools, over social media, on billboards, wherever. Um, and many there are towns across the country that do such programs. And I'm hoping that some investigation is done as to what other cities and towns are doing. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Do I'd I like to, Sandra, go for I'd it. I'd like to attach this to what Jane said. She's right. Years ago in the school system, we did a campaign and we had blue bins in every classroom and that's where the paper products went. And we, the children in each grade level did their own poster with slogans and Several were selected from each grade level and then finalized it, like six of them, and submitted them to the city. And there was a group that looked at them and used them for billboards and used them to put on trash bins. And we had more trash bins around the city, too. And they had these on them. I was thinking the only way we're going to stop the problem is if we educate the youth. And the more you educate the youth, starting with a kindergarten on up, Eventually, it does stick enough that they do say things to their parents and they do come back to school and say, you know what they did? They put oil in the sewer. So they try to stop these behaviors with what they've learned in school. 
And we used to have an ecology program in school besides the ecos. That's gone. That has to come back. So, so many things we need to do. And I agree with Jane. We're picking up their trash and it's not going to do anything because the trash is still going to be there until we hit it in their pocketbook and until we get the children involved. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to stay on this topic if others have input specifically on this. I'm really liking the, the tag on. Phil, do you have a thought on this? Go for it. I mean, I completely agree with Jane that it, <clears throat> that the efforts can't be just pick up the trash and that it, we need to have a comprehensive campaign. Um, you know, I think one of the, there has to be a way to try to educate and push you know, business owners to take responsibility for picking up in front of their businesses, including in the gutter in the street near them. And the same thing with residential folks that whether they're owners or renters, you know, I, they, that they have a responsibility to uh, to clean up their own tree belts and the, and the gutters in front of their own properties. Um, and I think that's what the campaign should be aimed at, that kind of thing, that it's their responsibilities to do this and to have in order for us to have a livable city. The only other comment I wanted to make is that I get the feeling that there are uh, at least three different efforts going on. I'm not sure what, you know, attorney, uh, I mean, Councillor Letterman seems to have one thing going on. The mayor has another thing going on. Maybe Councillor DeVia has another thing. So, I mean, it seems like it should be one united effort where everybody's on the same page. Um, and we don't have like splinter groups kind of doing their own thing. But that's that's all that I wanted to share. You touched a bit on um, code enforcement as well as um, the educational component earlier and also on lack of coordination between various efforts on, at the city. So thank you on those three points. I definitely got them down. I see Keith O'Connor has his hand up. So I'm gonna, I, I would love to hear that comment. And then on to Jacqueline Pleat. Hello, can you yes. Okay, so, so and, and listening, are you getting a feedback? Is there a feedback? Oh, there's there some feedback. feedback. Are, are you on a phone as well? Uh, I, yes, I am. And that's I, what's giving us the feedback. You'll have to mute one or the other, your computer or your phone. Okay, let me see if I can mute my phone. While he um, works on that, Jacqueline, would you like to speak up? Sure. Um, when my husband and I were first retired three or four years ago, we were very tired of the litter in our immediate area. And we would go out with a big black trash bag and pick up litter down Bellevue, up Belmont to Marengo and back again. We would completely fill a huge black trash bag. And we'd go out the next week and it was exactly the same thing. So I sort of want to second that I think, although cleanup would be great, there are areas that could really be improved visually temporarily. That the problem really is in the long-term prevention. And I would agree what's been said that we need to do more to uh, work with the youth in our area and the schools to teach uh, people about the importance of you know, maintaining our neighborhoods. But I think that code enforcement is equally important. I would love to see businesses and residences ticketed. I, unfortunately, I, I think the negative uh, penalty has gonna, is gonna be more effective than the positive, like, please keep your neighborhood clean. Um, I also wonder if, and this is a bigger issue, a lot of what we picked up was sort of Wendy's, fast food, McDonald's, that people I think throw out of their cars and I would love to see these companies find or we use money from them to maintain our neighborhoods. Um, and I don't know how that can be done, but really what gets thrown from these fast food companies is very discouraging. So more on code enforcement. 
um, which we heard a lot, which we're starting to hear a lot in emails as well. And then secondly, I also noticed that problem with the, uh, and I, and I think all of us have along, uh, along, uh, in, in our neighborhood, um, route 83 connecting to highway 90 uh, to, to 91. And then even on East Columbus Avenue, a lot of that trash appears to be fast food containers, even, um, nips and, uh, just, rubbish that's being thrown out of cars. So um, that is, like, I, I know that um, Juan Latore, who's on the call, sent in an email saying one of the problems add, adding on to the fact that that is happening is not knowing whose jurisdiction it is as individuals. We don't know if we're supposed to be talking to DPW versus is this a state issue? Is it a federal issue because it's a highway? Um, those sort of things might make it easier for us to also... Um, to figure out. Uh, Keith, did you figure out your sound problem? Let's give it a try. Okay. Am I here now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I, I was trying to maneuver a new iPad, but uh, I was, uh, it, it wasn't working, put it that way. So I went to my phone. But, hi, everybody. Um, so just listening uh, in on the uh, meeting here, I think, uh, you know, basically there's, I guess, solutions that we can try to, um, carry out, pass the word to people, um, especially uh, if you're in your vehicle there. Uh, I, I think maybe carrying a, a litter bag in your vehicle, um, make sure trash cans uh, are tight, fitted, closed, uh, people not overfilling their trash cans. Um, probably get your neighbors involved. That's that's uh, one of the most important things. Let them know uh, that you really don't want you know rubbish or any uh, garbage around that creates a breeding ground. Uh, one of the things is, um, you know, everybody's afraid nowadays of um, mosquitoes and rodents and rats and stuff like that, but leaving uh, rubbish around, littering, uh, especially auto tires there, it will harbor uh, mosquitoes and rodents there. And that's a big problem there. You know, and, and I, you know, looked online and some of the uh, solutions that was suggested online other towns do. And one of the things that probably makes sense is that they suggest probably planting more flowers. And I guess um, it, they stated that people are, are, are less likely to litter where flowers are, are on the ground there, which I, I agree. I really don't see that much uh, probably littering around flowers there. Um, make more um, signs out um, uh, educating our, our youth there. I think if you educate the youth there, um, that they would pass it on, um, starting at a young age there. Um, carrying portable ashtrays, that's probably one of the, the biggest thing now. I think everyone that smokes in their cars, uh, they have a, a habit of throwing their cigarette buds right out the window there. And I saw another statistic there saying that 38% of litter comes from cigarette buds there. And I think the newer cars nowadays, they don't carry ashtrays right. there. So it's a thing of the past there. Um, I remember, you know, as a, as a kid, um, when I'm with my parents and uh, just say going to like a local gas station or something like that there, I remember they used to distribute um, like a plot, 20 second a bag. morning. They, they used to uh, distribute bags there. Uh, you know, for your car, so you can throw your trash inside of your bag there. Um, that's probably, you know, something that maybe, I mean, there's a way of um, trying to get funding to distribute disposable bags for people to keep in their car so they can put the rubbish in there. Um, Those the, are, Keith, your, th yep. your three minutes are up. Can you okay. wind it up quickly? Just. <clears throat> Uh, and, and, and last but not least there, uh, one, of the, one of the problems I always hear about is uh, uh, people not cleaning up uh, after their pets there. That's, that's a big issue there. So they should keep in mind to uh, bring, a, bring a trash bag with them or, or bag to pick up after their, 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 their pet. 
Yes. I heard a lot of tag-ons there and great solutions. So thank you for those thoughts. One of the new issues that uh, Keith just brought up was windblown trash that happens in residential areas. When you overfill your trash can or you allow it to be propped up. So I think the thoughts on how, you know, educating um, homeowners specifically on this pace um, on not, you know, trying not to do those things are great. And then all of the other solutions I, I noted as well. Awesome. Next up, Lynn, I know you've been trying to speak for a while. Then we'll go to um, Katery and Margo. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so you mentioned the um, code enforcement. Um, it, uh, I think that can they do like scheduled uh, code checks? Like, you know, you can say, oh, you know, we're going to do uh, West Forest Park is where I live. We're going to do these four streets and we're going to go through and see that are there cars parked on the lawn? Is there trash strewn everywhere? Um, you know, uh, you know, we instead of how he's relying on um, neighbors have to call if there's like a real problem. Um, you know, I pick up trash all the time, like in front of my house, like you say, there's cups and Dunkin Donuts things thrown. I live off of a busy street on Dwight Road. There's a lot of trash thrown, I, you know, um, but if they did a scheduled code check, you know, you could you would go through the neighborhood and you would see, oh, this, you know, this is a violation. Let the homeowner know fine. You know, if they're paying a fine for this, that, you know, they're going to, you know, have to address it versus somebody, you know, just uh, going and picking up the trash for them every day. So I think, can they do that? Uh, I mean, I thought that that was done years ago where they would do scheduled checks and just, you know, have a, um, you know, different neighborhoods and they would go out on their own and see, you know, what the problems were and address them. So that would be, I think that would be great. That would, you know, be helpful. Yeah, uh, that is a great idea for keeping, you know, for getting code enforcement to happen. Um, and, and of course, we have multiple um, individuals on the call whose work is in code enforcement. So hopefully they're yep. taking note on that. Um, yep. And uh, one other thing you you mentioned is calling in. So 311, uh, one of the um, comments that came up in a, one of our committee meetings already was being able to track that your 311 report is working, that that resulted in um you know, some sort of enforcement um, would be helpful for residents because you, you don't always know when you call in if that ended up um, resulting in any sort of enforcement. Or you can see your you can see in your neighborhood that it did it and you keep calling. So right. Um, and then one but, last part of that. So um, if we have community policing officers that are assigned to our neighborhood. Should we be calling them or calling 311 or does it depend on the nature of the call? So it sounds like you're expressing a lack of uh, me. I think a number of residents aren't, aren't sure where they should report litter. Um, and so that will be something we can address in our report. And, and if any, by the way, if anyone wants to, it has the answer to that. But my understanding at this point is 311 calls. And now we have litter at springfieldcityhall.com where you can report litter issues there as well. That's the clean sweep initiative. So for yep. now, the solutions that I am aware of are Call 311 and send emails, especially I recommend putting photos just so they can easily identify the location to um, litter at springfieldcityhall.com. Uh, okay. All right. On to Catery. And then we have Margo. Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Uh, I do have a cold, so I apologize. But, uh, you know, a lot of the, the calls I get are from people who want to know if can they recycle every week. Uh, I know, Chris, that's something you've you've talked about, but a lot of people see that as a possible solution, having more opportunity to get rid of their recycling. And, and also one, one other thought before I totally lose my voice, if there is gonna be a coordinated citywide campaign, um, I think you should think about incentives. We seem to work. Incentives for which party would you recommend? Pardon me? Which party would you recommend the incentive for? Well, it would depend on what you what this committee comes up with their their idea. I mean, if you involve school children, there are various levels of incentives or or businesses. You know, sometimes rather than being punitive, giving a reward goes a long way. I like that. That's a nice yeah. positive take because we do want to enforce codes. Uh, is there a way that we can say, "Hey, way to go"? <laughs> I, well, you know, it's a long time ago. I was in Ireland and anybody that has visited there, they always did the Tidy Town Award. And it was a big deal to, to actually get that Tidy Town banner or sticker. So incentives do work. I like that as a case study. So we'll make sure we put the Tidy Town Award down to research because I like We should all go to Ireland and check it out. Yeah. <laughs> 
On to um, Margot Eckert and then to Chris Signoli. Hi, everybody. Um, I also want to echo the need for education in our schools, but uh, my, I observe a lot of adults um, littering. And so that is a problem. And a lot of people from outside our community throw things out their windows when they go down Belmonte Avenue to connect to 91, um, mm -hmm. go to the fast food restaurants. So it's this is a regional problem, not just a, um, uh, a, a need to enlighten our school children. Um, Phil also, uh, said a comment that I've, uh, I applaud, which is there seems to be some competing initiatives going on in the city and that has to end. I think we all have to be on the same page. Uh, the desire to hire people from ROCA or teenagers, that's an intermittent solution. That's not a long-term solution. I think our city must get cleaned up and it has to be under a city department. I think the streets have to be swept a lot more often because a lot of the stuff is in the curb. And um, I, I heard reference to East Columbus Avenue, which is a garbage can. Mm. It's you saying it's a jurisdictional problem is an excuse. Oh, it's been a ju uh, jurisdictional problem for how many years? That trash has been out there for years and years and years. Clean it up. That's all you have to do. I and my son also, like Jackie Pleat, we go out with garbage uh, bags and fill our garbage bags. And sometimes I don't feel safe mm. because of the neighborhoods I do it in. Why am I doing this? Get out of the car, somebody. It's City Hall and clean up East Columbus Avenue. Yeah, I agree. It's an embarrassment. So I heard a great comment. So thank you so much for that. And I know that we've forwarded some of your photos. So thank you for uh, to on to the Clean Sweep Initiative, um, Margo. So thank you for your engagement. And um, we've heard so a, a number of people commenting on some of the, the new proposals and new initiative have said they love that the city is starting to take this seriously. And what I heard from you is we need it under a city department with dedicated resources and leadership. So I, I think that. OK, so we have next in the lineup was Chris Signoli. Then we have Juan Latore. Sure. Okay. Actually, I was going to I was going to ask a, a, a favor of my friend Keith. Uh, uh, Keith, could you explain to everybody kind of the overlap and also the difference between your guys as well as police ordinance? Because I know that's one of the common questions and complaints that I get as to which one has responsibility for certain things. And when it comes to, and the reason why I'm asking that question, Keith and the ordinance really deal on the private side where we deal on the public side of the right of way. So there gets to be a little confusion. So I was wondering, Keith, if you could explain that. Um, so um, a lot of times we 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 get calls. Uh, the the calls are um, or complaints are generated through the three one one call center there, uh, and they will uh, enhance um, give us the complaint. We'll send out an inspector out to inspect the property uh, in regards to you know rubbish trash or whatever have you there the ordinance squad uh who's assigned to the area may get the same uh type of complaint and they also will enforce uh city ordinance when it comes to rubbish trash dumping um someone had asked a question earlier i can't remember what her name was i'm sorry but uh, to um you know definitely initiate Lynn. it was Lynn. Oh, Lynn. okay Lynn to to definitely initiate a complaint it, it it's starting through the 311. Uh, I know some people they may have a phone number for their local uh, ordinance officer which is good and then enhance the uh, normally uh, the officer will then uh, 
uh, pair up with the inspector in that area. And they may go out uh, together. They may go out separately there, but they're all on the same page uh, when it comes to rubbish, trash. And I know she had, uh, Lynn had mentioned the cars on the front lawn there. Uh, at code enforcement, we do do uh, street sweeps. We do go proactive and, and uh, reactive. Uh, matter of fact, uh, when was it? Yesterday, we were in the Mattoon area, street area there with the flex officers. We've done Forest Park. Uh, I believe that was the last time we were in that area all together with the flex officers. That was in September. I want to say it was August, September, right around that time period. And um we, you know, we've done the um, uh, Mason Square area there. Uh, but normally uh, during the, I should say, spring, summer uh, type of times there, we do uh, have uh, proactive inspections like on a Saturday, which they mainly, the inspectors mainly will write up the uh, rubbish and trash and look for uh, any illegal use there. If there's a zoning uh, inspector with them, of course, zoning deals with legal use of properties there, and they would see if there's any anything else going on in, uh, in regards to the rubbish, trash, uh, cars, and illegal businesses, and so on, tractor trailers, commercial vehicles, I should say, there. Thank you for that. And I see our, our ordinance officer, Chad Joseph, just raised his hand. So Chad, not quite yet. We'll go with Juan, and then we'll go with you, Chad, and then back to Jacqueline. Juan. Okay, great. I'm just going to unmute and say hi, and then I'm going to stop my video because for some reason it keeps going green on me when I have the video on. So I'll be brief. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm a hopeful person. So I, I believe in the mantra of if you give people the opportunity to do the right thing, they tend to do the right thing. I'm going to try to provide a concrete example. Um, many of you know Alice Richard in the Forest Park neighborhood. She does so much for the Boy Scouts. Uh, and she lives near the intersection of Belmont and Hall. And there is a, a three or four story apartment complex there. And, and I visit her a lot to help her with work for the Boy Scouts. And uh, there's a large dumpster there. And um, when the dumpster isn't full, I generally see that everyone throws uh, their garbage in the dumpster from the apartment. And then when it is full, I, I see that the residents take out their garbage and they just leave it on the side of the dumpster. And, you know, that might be fine or we might have a windy day and a lot of things that are loose might blow all over the neighborhood. So I, I have a suggestion to the city and, and the city councilors that are on the call. Maybe it already exists. But it, it occurred to me that um, dumpster sizes, required dumpster sizes based on the size of the uh, apartment structures, you know, the number of, of um, apartments, tenants, whatever you want to call it, might be something worth looking at. So we don't have situations for our friends in our apartment complexes in, in Forest Park where there's just simply not enough space for them to throw their garbage relative to the amount of rubbish they are generating. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Yes, I've seen that myself as well. On to Chad. Off Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. Um, just just to let you know, like I am out of work, so I I'm pretty much here as a resident. I, I am a resident of East Forest Park, so, but I'm not gonna shy away from any questions with work-related questions either, so. Um, one thing I do want to say, um, I've been in the Forest Park neighborhood for over eight years, um, C3, and, and now in the uh, Ordnance Flex Squad. And one thing I've noticed from um, the first day, um, you know, I'm a big, big proponent, big fan of Springfield, okay, in the neighborhood. But it, it, it does have challenges in the Forest Park neighborhood. It's a very transient community. And with that, what I mean is... Um, there's not a lot of home ownership in the Forest Park neighborhood. It's a lot of renters, okay? So with that being said, I mean, the education um, where um, obviously at an early, early age, the school children, I, I think that would do great things. Some kind of, um, you know, the education where, I mean, we all wear seatbelts now because my kids get in the car, they're like, dad, where's your seatbelt? You know, because they've been educated. So um you know, maybe maybe there's can be some sort of community service for the school children, maybe the high school kids and junior high, where they get school credit of some sort. Um, obviously, education for the adults. Um, 
you know, promote some sort of uh, ownership, even though you are a renter, you know, some, some pride in your street, maybe some neighborhood street teams. Um, there's a lot of ideas. Um, there's not going to be one single solution to, to this, you know, concern. Um, the 311 system, please use it. We, we need that to track. And while we do have phone numbers and we never discourage a phone call, we really need to track these concerns on these specific properties or, uh, uh, you know, owners or landlord, whatever it might be. So I, I really encourage the 311 system. It works. It really does. It's going to go to the proper department immediately. Um, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine, that 311 system. Um, we also, um, I, I hear a lot about uh, enforcement. Um, I know uh, the city, the Springfield police, we issue thousands upon thousands and thousands of citations mm -hmm. per year. Um, it's necessary sometimes. Sometimes it's an education um, to be like, hey, you, you can't do this or you got to do this. Um, but it's a reactive system. Um, you know, with, with that being said, the reactive system, I mean, it's all, we're always going to need the clean city, the DPW, the, the city and the Springfield police ordinance. We all work great together. There's good collaboration. Um, but we don't want to create a system where we don't educate and, and, and change. Like we, we need to fix the root cause of the problem and not just react and, and, and pick up trash and create a city department where all we do is pick up trash because you know what? People are still going to throw trash. We need to change that part of it and try to, you know, um, somehow, I don't have all the answers for that. And, and, and maybe it's a little bit of everything. We're still going to need, you know, the departments we have. Um, but definitely we got to get more on the proactive part rather than just be reactive. Um, so I, jot, I, I put some notes down. I don't know. I'm all over the place on this. But, um, you know, like I said, and, and I, one, another thing I heard is, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm hearing there's three different groups working on this issue. And I don't look at that as a negative. The more ideas, the more heads, you know, thinking about this, you know, everybody can pull all the greatest ideas and try to come up with a good system because it's, it's important to everyone. Quality of life. What I've learned through my years with the police department is quality of life is so important. And if somebody's going to stay in the city or leave the city, it, it, quality of life is a big part of that. So, um, you know, it, this is, uh, I, I didn't realize how um, great the concern is and, and some of the issues are until I got to this squad, the, the ordinance squad. Um, you know, you, you drive around all day and you might see someone throw a McDonald's bag out the car at the, the stoplight, which is drives me crazy. But when your job is to look for trash, I mean, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's it's. So there, there's good, there, there, there needs to be, I know there's a lot of work, great work being done, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So um, like I said, it's, there's going to have to be many, many different solutions to this. It sounds like one of the big things that a lot of people are touching on is the education point, and it's tough to determine where that should live. But I think a, a lot of us agree that that is a, a missing component um, with, and, and as you mentioned, and as others mentioned, both with um, kids, younger younger kids, and all the way up through high school, um, you can often find trash along the, the school walking routes, you know, right outside of um, the schools. Um, so there's that issue, but then also adults who are driving around throwing stuff out windows or waiting at bus stops, dropping their, the bus stops are another big spot down the main arteries where there's lots of foot traffic, pedestrians throwing stuff in on the street, on, in the uh, sidewalks, in even planters. Um, I think it was Keith O'Connor who said planting flowers, but I did, we actually have a picture from a, a resident of, of a planter for flowers, just full on, I believe it was Belmont Ave, um, just full of 
a bunch of trash because uh, there was a lack of a trash can. So people just thought, well, that's a receptacle. We'll put it there. Um, education is one of those things. It's interesting. There are some there's small, small little ad, um, ad hoc groups. I have a uh, Earth Celebrate Earth Day here, um, which is run by Catherine Oriana from the public schools. She uh, is doing the, along with Ecos, is doing the poster contest again this year, April 23rd, 2023. This is a small initiative, but one that, you know, one that is, is doing something. Um, but it is that question of how do we get a full curriculum through K to 12? And um, how do we educate residents and businesses about their um, actual duty um, uh, as as um, residents? All right, uh, I Jacqueline, I believe you are next, and then we have Ralph and Keith. Your hand is still up. Do you want to speak after them, or is should I, or should I lower your hand on here? Uh, you can lower for now. Okay, perfect. All right, on to Jacqueline, then Ralph. Great. Uh, you had mentioned this very briefly, Erica. Uh, this is something that hasn't been brought up before, but my husband and I wonder why there are no trash cans, trash receptacles on at least the major streets, Belmont, Sumner, with the streets that, you know, people drive through throwing things out their window. And DPW must may have an explanation. I don't know if studies show that trash cans help or hinder, but I do really wonder why we have none. You know, people are not going to carry their trash till they get home. You must have been peeking at my notes over here. Uh, go I, ahead, Chris. I'll I let you just, take it. I had just written that down. Um, yeah, I'll respond to it. And actually, probably over the last couple of years, we've probably removed throughout the city probably 30 or 40 trash cans. Uh, you know, north end, south end, uh, the X area, for the specific reason that businesses dump. And when uh, we put in on Main Street, we put in different types of their enclosures that have worked a little bit, and we're going to be trying those in other areas of the city. But in the X and in the South End, uh, the mayor being a great example, drives in every day and would call me virtually every day and say, this can at the X. And literally one time he yelled at me saying, I called you yesterday and told you to go pick this stuff up. We did. Uh, apartment units and businesses dump. And uh, I mentioned a Kushnitz street down in the South end. There was a barrel there every morning. There would be 20 or 30 trash bags there. And it would be from residents. It would be from the businesses. Um, and it was like, okay, we're going down every day and picking this stuff up. We take them out and that goes away. Obviously then there's no place to put the trash, but it became a balance of illegal dumping versus uh, being able to dispose of trash on its own. So what we're trying to do now, and uh, some of the some of you groups who have, have been involved with the ARPA neighborhood stuff, uh, we're doing some going to be doing some more construction in the north end associated with sidewalks and things like that. So we're going to be putting in these what I'm calling enclosed enclosures, where you have uh, you know it's basically a big square, but your receptacle for putting in trash is only that big. So somebody walking down the street can put that in there versus having those typical just big open trash cans. So we're going to be starting to install those around the city in the spring and kind of see how that goes. But the illegal dumping that was coming out of, you know, one in the South End, I'm not going to mention the businesses, you know, 20 or 30 cans and it, or 20 or 30 bags. And it was every night. And the explanation was, I don't have to pay for a dumpster city's going to come and pick it up. And so that was one of the reasons why we started to get rid of them. But we're going to start installing those types of bigger enclosures um, that will allow just trash to be there. And the other good thing, too, in some of those neighborhoods is we, we're some cases in the X we do, it's going to be expanded, but we have a lot of uh, cameras around so we can start to figure out who these businesses are who are bringing things out. And unfortunately at the X, it was a lot of the restaurants. They were just dumping stuff because they're paying by weight. Uh, so whatever they can put out on the street is gonna save them five or 10 bucks in a dumpster. Uh, I did see that the cameras were a big part of the um, Clean City initiative. Um, so that would be interesting. Uh, if if you if that's working, you know it would be interesting to learn if that's working. Uh, you don't have to answer now, obviously, but something to consider. Um, dumping was another thing that's been we've been we've gotten in advance of this um, a number of dumping 
mostly related to, well, there are two types. One is residents um, dumping in streets, come driving up in a truck and just dumping stuff out on the street. Um, on my street, just around the corner, uh, on Piney Woods and Forest Park Ave, it got cleaned up really quickly. So, so, so some of these street dumpings, um, the cleanup crews are very quick on those. That's great whenever the reportings happen, but there was a, a literal full blown spa tub that got dumped on the street a, a couple of weeks ago. It got cleaned up Within hours. So congratulations to the, I believe that's DPW or they said they uh, been- probably clean cities who did most of that. And that's the group under Pat. Okay. Got it. Um, so uh, yes. Great. Um, and, uh, and then the other group was um, on this call, um, Jay uh, Latori mentioned um, the, the dumping that happens around uh, dumpsters, but also you just were talking about dumping that happens around trash cans. So mm-hmm. um big problems trying to get to that root problem would be nice to figure out. Um, and hopefully the cameras prove to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Ralph, then Beata. Yes. I just had, um, well, I had one comment, which is that I, you know, I think that people who, who live in houses in the neighborhood have been doing a, a marvelous job of keeping their own properties up. The, the exception usually does seem to be the rental properties. And, you know, there certainly there have been some that I've called in that, they don't ever seem to improve. I hope that there can be something that is designed to, you know, lean on those property owners a little bit more to clean up their properties that they own. I know that they're not dumping themselves as their tenants, but on the other hand, they do have a responsibility, I think, to the neighborhood. But the other question I have is, is there any uh, program that the city currently has that takes care of public properties? So, you know, for example, there may be a lot that the city owns and I don't think it's necessarily people who are dumping trash there. I think it's more just the typical litter that blows, you know, blows out of the back of trucks. It blows out of the, you know, when a, when a garbage can falls over, it blows around. And most people will pick that up if it's on their own lawn. But if it's on the city property or if it's on the state property, like down the highway, uh, the 91 off ramp, you know, a couple of years ago, I went out there. and I think we filled up four or five garbage bags from that strip. Um, you know, that seems to be a little bit less uh, less taken care of, basically. I know that the the Hamden County Sheriff's has got a team that goes out and targets certain areas from time to time, but it seems like it could be, you know, a matter of like three, four weeks, months even before certain properties get cleaned up that are publicly owned. Uh, that is definitely that co- that uh, basically you're getting to that jurisdiction question of that I don't even know the answer to really about the the highways or um another one that came up in an email in advance of this um, was the like Springfield Housing Authority properties um, who is in charge of cleaning those up because there were a couple that were pointed out by residents. Um, that and one was outside of our ward, but one was in the ward um, that they that I uh, some pictures came in and. I honestly don't know the answer to that one, um, but it is something that we'll put in. And hopefully when we're debriefing um, with some of the people on this call, hopefully we're going to be inviting um, our special guests to a debrief uh, for basically questions that come up that aren't answered on here. Um, but that that is a question on that jurisdiction and how do we hold the right uh, crew accountable? Beata. Um, and then Don to Sandra. I'm just going to follow up on that. The, the, the whole camera oh. question. <laughs> Patrick Sullivan's on this call, and I know they've been very effective in Forest Park with uh, kind of patrolling some of this dumping. I wonder if Patrick could talk a little bit about the effectiveness of the cameras, and is that something that he envisions could be used on a broader scale to actually catch these people who are dumping and I know that there there was at least one instance of public shaming. They they put them on the news, video from these cameras of these people dumping. Um, so, yes. sure, I'd be happy to do that. And I, I just want to echo Chris and Chad's um, comments that one we all do work well together, and there's no competition. So I just want to clear up that uh, we are all working well together to, to accomplish this uh, cleanup of the city. Um, and I've been working out, this is my 37th year with the city and litter, unfortunately, in certain parts of the city has been just a continual problem. And we will continue to work with all of you to, to address it. But the camera systems have worked very well um, to the point where we have uh, one individual that has up to 15 dumpings caught. And so we are working now with the police department to increase the fines. The fines are just too low. So it's cheaper to dump. 
pay the penalty. And so we are working on revising uh, the ordinance as we speak. Um, uh, someone mentioned East Columbus Avenue. Believe it or not, we have a crew that does a suite on East and West Columbus Avenue weekly. The trash is just so great. We can clean it up by that afternoon. There's new trash just constantly. We have a hard time getting on the other side of the fence from the highway side of it. And a lot of that can't be done till the spring. So between basically November through April, it's just very difficult getting permission from the highway to access that other side of the fence. But we're doing our best to get it, but it's just a continual. But good idea is there a way to focus cameras on certain locations? And can we get lucky enough to catch someone that's dumping it out of their car as they're driving down East Columbus? And so we're, we're doing that now. But we have 22 cameras up uh, throughout the city now for illegal dumping. Uh, they're checked weekly. And uh, we work with the ordinance squad on those issues. And they, they give citations and tickets. We go to court with these individuals and um, it's been successful. And Biad is right. We quarterly do a public shaming and the newspaper prints their picture and their name in the paper. So we're about to come out with that again. And uh, so I just want you to know, uh, Chris and I talk weekly about dumping. Uh, we have the Clean City program who does a fantastic job. So in my little department, we do over 300 tons of trash pickup annually. So it's just really remarkable. And all of our park crews do the parks throughout the city cleaning up trash. Um, there are at least three days a week doing trash. And then I just want to thank Roca came to uh, the mayor uh, about four months ago. And it's taken that long to get this agreement done with Roca. And um, we realize it is not the solution, but it's going to get us going. And that's where the mayor came up with the idea of the email so residents can just email, and that's working great. So we've gotten 15 emails. Russ Seelig, since he's been out of the longest, his was the first one answered today. So Russ, if you go to your two locations, I think you'll see that they've been picked up. And what, to Erica's point, what we're going to be doing is sending an email back to, to Russ to get something by Monday. Your area has been addressed on this date. That way, if you drive by and see it again, please email us so we can start doing this. And then there's been another question that came up. Will we do some curbs? There's, I, and I, you know, I live in the city. Chris lives in the city. So we drive. We see people just are probably, there's probably rental houses. So our plan is if it's on the public way, yes, we're going to clean it up once. But we're also going to write a letter to that homeowner, whoever owns the car. Hey, we cleaned it up this time, but you know what, you're going to own it from here on in just because, uh, you know, neighbors shouldn't have to live with that. And so we're going to be sensitive. So we uh, intend to work with all of you and we enjoying hearing all these ideas and we don't have the solutions, but maybe we can get to a final day where litter will bless. And I think you're right. It's education. We got to get the kids in, involved somehow. And I, I know Sandra Bell, I think, when you were a principal, I think I worked with you on a, on a program at your school many, many years ago. On many years ago. Yeah. And, you know, we had no trash in our schoolyard. You know why? Because the kids yeah. got tired of cleaning it up. Right. You're right. They had a so, time where they had to pick it up and they got after everybody. You can't put that on the ground. I don't yeah. want to pick it up. Yeah. I always just remember growing up that the uh, the there used to be public campaigns at the national level for litter. Right. So, um, so anyway, we look forward to working with all of you. Fantastic comments, uh, Patrick. Those are the, I think you said 320 tons of track, trash picked up annually. The 22 cameras checked weekly, all of this public shaming quarterly. I'm liking all these numbers, by the way. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I get excited about reporting back on those details. <laughs> yeah. And so we have that, that group works with the ordinance squad, the police department, you know, all parts of the city have a, a legal dump. And for whatever reason, maybe because it is like someone said, it's kind of a transient neighbor forest park does seem to get hit the hardest for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. So, and just driving the city, I don't know if you know, our other hotspot is North Branch Parkway. That's a heavy dumping zone too. But I, I really have to, you know, Roke is only one week with us, but already it's working. And um, I think it's a great program for their participants. 
and they had gotten a state grant and they're sharing that that grant with the city to get this off the ground and maybe that will can be, become a permanent solution because these individuals need work experience and that's going to make them uh, they're, they're residents of the city that's going to make them positive uh, citizens for our Springfield. So I think it's a win-win on both sides on that issue. Yes, it is. Yes. We have a couple of people up. I will tell you it's Sandra, then Victor, then Russ, then Chris. And I, I do, um, since um, Patrick just talked about uh, the ROCA program, I do want to recognize uh, the Solomon Bayman, who's here, who just also commented in the chat. He is the director of ROCA Western Mass, and it is his crew that is doing all this work through the Clean Sweep Initiative. Um, so thanks for being here, Solomon. Onward to Sandra. I'll make it quick. You know, we also have to, the, that neighborhood app, South Forest Park. Obviously, I go on it. I had a running discussion with a woman that says the, the streets, the tree belts, and the sidewalks belong to the city. I'm not cleaning them up. And I said, why don't you go to the Good Neighbor Handbook? You can go online for it. And you'll see that three feet out from the curbstone is your responsibility, plus oh. the street belt, plus the sidewalk. Says, no, it isn't. I'm not doing it. Let them come and get me. And then she cut it off so you couldn't talk to her at all. You couldn't reason with her. But I'm wondering, there's got to be more like that, because some of the people said, we like this. We like this. Um, we've got to get those people, too, because just because you keep your lawn clean, up to the sidewalk it doesn't mean you're not responsible for the rest. Yes, the city owned, but you are responsible. So that's something we also, maybe we're not clear enough in the Good Neighbor Handbook on it. Um, also, one other thing about too many people don't know any of those simple rules that are in the Good Neighbor Handbook. Originally, they were made to go with the realtors who sell the house. Here's a Good Neighbor Handbook. But that didn't happen. We hand them out at the Sector H meetings, but we don't get that many people. And we did have a lot of people in the beginning, but of course, COVID came along and you can't exactly hand them out in Zoom. And then you need people to keep them updated. It's a lot of work. But some of those simple things, maybe we need to get the TV involved because people don't read like they should. We get them involved to do a little burp, blurb at the bottom. Maybe, you know, an or uh, something like a notification, an ordinance, a rule, a, a, a slogan, something. We need to get it into people's heads, and this we kind of use everything. The social media we need to use. Just the thought. Thank you. Thank you for that. And on the Good Neighbor Handbook, I don't know how many people on here know about this, but it's, here's what it looks like. The um. It goes through ordinances that are relevant to us as neighbors, and it even has the contact information for the ordinance flex squad, of which Chad Joseph is ours, um, for Sector H. Um, this is also available online. I, it, if you Google it, you can find it. Um, but I'll be honest, I didn't really know about this be, uh, until uh, just late last year. Um, as I got more and more involved with the neighborhood, I, I learned about this. Um, and I, I read, I was happy that it was easy to see the different ordinances. I didn't even know that uh, residents had to do three feet into the street, those sort of details. Um, and I, I think if I, as an educated individual who's chairing a litter committee, didn't know that, then certainly the average Springfield resident doesn't know about that. So I do echo what you just said, Sandra, on distribution. And even I'm a realtor myself, and I hadn't even thought about giving this to new residents. So that's, you know, you just blew my mind. I was like, wow, why didn't I think about that? Um, I think that distributing, finding a way to better distribute these as a part of the education plan and maybe making them a little more exciting and cool to read might help out um, as well. Uh, so okay. page 18. On page 18, maintenance of tree belts. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read it. I finally learned some new rules about my own citizenship. So that was helpful. <laughs> um, okay, so next up we had, uh, I might have to remind myself in the comments, it was Sandra, then Victor, and then Russ and Chris. Victor. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, the, Pat, uh, can you remind us, or maybe even Joseph, uh, what's the current fine for illegal dumping in the city? I think it starts like a 250 chat and it might go up as high as 500. 
So, so yeah, there, there's a there's a sliding scale. I mean, which, which are you ta- are you talking just uh, general uh, littering from like, or are we talking like the city ordinance as, you know, if I'm um, um, finding a property, or am I finding an individual? Well, can you can you give us both? Okay, so um, I mean, littering for um, I mean, basically for both, it's going to go um, uh, one two. I, I believe it's. I've been, you know, I'm new to the squad, so. I actually have the answer. It's, it's right one, here in the good name brand book. <laughs> is it yeah, one, two, fifty, five hundred, yeah. or? It's one, two, three hundred. It says litter on private one, two, and public okay. property. It's uh, ordinance 32713.m. Hopefully I read that right. It says right here, enforcement, code enforcement department. You call 413-787-6030. Um, we, or, you know, this is for on private and public properties, first ticket, 100, second ticket, 200, third ticket, 300. That is, if this is up to date, the word, the one I have, um, it's, if, okay. if it's December, 2022, it's up to date. Right. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you. Uh, there is a higher fee for the bigger bulk dumping that we use. This, right. we, use this, we use the state fines for that. And I think and, it's also goes higher. We, don't forget either. There's a criminal charge. For right. as as um, Pat knows um, and and Chris knows all the city departments. I mean, you know the larger illegal dumping issues. We we do file crim apps, so we take that to court. And and if we find, and we're very good at this. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we got a part of the job is sifting through trash. We will follow the leads, and if it leads us out of town, well, we're going to leave town, and we're going to investigate, and we're going to hold those people responsible. We are going to take them to court, and 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 it, it as Patrick said, I mean whether it's you know the the city cameras, the park department cameras, or police cameras, or even residential cameras, we utilize those as well. Um, we we are going to um, investigate it like any other crime. I mean, we it, it, unfortunately, you know, we can't just have people pull up in a a, a truck and, and just dump. Right. Sometimes it's hazardous waste. I mean, don't get me. I mean, you know, not every time, but sometimes. I mean, it could right. be loaded with asbestos. Right. right. It could be, you know, who knows what's in that. So, right. Right. Um, right. you know, we do take that very serious and, and hold them accountable. In, in the right, you know, it, it, maybe it's a ticket for a hundred mm-hmm. bucks. Maybe we take them to court, and it, and it has a lot more teeth when we go to court. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chad. And, and the last thing, Eric, I will continue because I know uh, uh, we are listening, but I do have uh, something that I, I know I've spoken before, and this is more for for Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, we have spoken uh, before, and I know you have explained it, explained it uh, before, and I and I, I make my call again. I think it's critical, Chris, that we relook at the uh, yellow stickers, bulk stickers. Uh, a lot of people don't know that you have to buy a yellow bulk sticker. A lot of people don't know that you have to call for, for a yellow sticker. Uh, the location where they are right now, it's a uh, big one. Uh, that's, that's, that's a barrier for some people. Some of the more poor neighborhoods that we have here, that people don't have transportation um, to, or they can afford to go and buy $8, they're going to spend $3 to go buy $8, they come back. By the end of the day, it's like $15 uh, for, for one item. And the other thing, Chris, is the, uh, I don't think, please correct me if I'm mistaken, that we don't have anything uh, for electrical disposal. Like I believe the bulk pickup don't take TVs, refrigerators, anything that plugs in. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on what I know we discussed in the past. I know you made your case back then, but I really think that we need to relook at this with cold eyes because a lot of people, one, on the education part, which has been spoken at length verbatim already here in this meeting, they really don't know that they have to buy a bulk sticker. And two, uh, the affordability of the ticket and the accessibility of the tickets, something that should be, as I mentioned before, easily accessible in any local drugstore, in any bodega. Uh, so Chris, uh, it's something that I would like to, something that I, I, I'm gonna follow up with you later, uh, Chris, maybe we can talk more, more okay. uh, don't in depth, but give, if you could just give us a, a, a quick uh, 30 second review. Sure, we take electronics. Uh, 
The issue that we have with electronics now is we have to pick them up separately. So if you were to call tomorrow, Victor, and we were going to pick up a, well, let me, let me throw mattresses in there as an, as a new problem. Yeah. Uh, if you have put out a couch, if you put out a big uh, refrigerator and you put out a mattress, we have, we will be sending three completely separate crews because that material has to go to three completely separate places. Mm -hmm. So we do take electronics. Electronics used to go to Palmer. Now they go to Aguam. Um, and our regular bulk material goes to Wilbraham. And now our mattresses go to, uh, actually, we store them and they end up in Fitchburg. Uh, and just on, just on the bulk sticker, everything now is $8. It's still, still $8. It costs us uh, over $1,000 a ton to get rid of uh, electronics. Uh, so three refrigerators will cost us $2,000 to get rid of, and we take in $24 of revenue. Uh, mattresses, $8 to get rid of. It costs us $35 to get rid of each mattress on that. So uh, the, the issue that we also have with uh, bulk stickers, bulk stickers are available at City Hall, as well as Big Y. Uh, when we initially started the program, uh, every vendor who we were dealing with, for example, Big Y says, you can do them at our place. If you have them in other places, we're gonna charge you. We sell over 30,000 bulk stickers every year. Uh, so, you know, we've looked into, okay, can we get them in other places and uh, uh, be able to figure it out? We've looked into it and, you know, places like Big Y would say, I have a market. If you want to bring them other places, we're not going to let you sell them at Big Y anymore. So now it becomes where can we get the most bang for the buck to get them around the city in as many places as possible? Um, there, there was just a couple other things just briefly that I wanted to talk on. Somebody asked before about SHA. SHA controls their own properties. Uh, one of the big problems I have with SHA, four or five years ago, they modified their parking rules and regulations that in order to park anywhere on their property, you have to be a resident. So when you drive around SHA properties around, you see a ton of parking around those facilities. Uh, I can't remember which one is which, but the one that's at Bay in Berkshire, Egan Drive that's on one side, and I can't, I think it might be the extension of Jasper. Cars are parked up and down those streets. And so you end up with a ton of littering associated with it. There was a call last week from uh, Councillor Govan about that. Uh, I have my pet peeves about locations uh, that I sent to Keith and to the Ordnance Squad last week. My two big things is there's a property on the corner of Dwight Road and uh, and uh, uh, White Street, where I go by every day, car parked on the front lawn every morning. Uh, mm -hmm. The business mm -hmm. that's on the corner of Dorset and Sumner, not the gun shop, the one behind it. Two cars parked on the sidewalk all day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was out there last week, told the person they got to move it. They basically told me to go do whatever I, they wanted me to do to myself and said, I'm not going to move it. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. Unfortunately, that is some of the people that uh, we are dealing with. Right. One of the other items that was asked before is about street sweeping. Uh, I'm not sure whether this will shock people or, or not. We have four street sweepers. Four. We also have four street sweep drivers. Three years ago, they modified the rules and regulations. You have to have a hoisting license to drive a street sweeper. Uh, so trying to find people with a hoisting license to street sweeper, um, almost impossible these days. We have three openings right now. Uh, and if you know anybody who's looking for positions, we have a ton of openings. And the last one that somebody asked was about recycling, uh, moving recycling to twice a week. Uh, or excuse me, once, you know, doing it every week, excuse me, rather than every other week. Uh, three years ago, we as a city did not pay a penny to get rid of recycling. I'm now paying over a million dollars a year to get rid of recycling. Uh, we make revenue on it. We're making about 300,000, but from a budget standpoint, the city now loses about $700,000 a year getting rid of recycling. If we wanted to go to every week, uh, we do 5,500 properties a day, we would be going to 11,000 because that's, you know, basically what we do in a day for trash. And we do about 8,000 tons of 
recycling at about 48,000 tons of trash. Uh, so when if you were to double that route, you're basically talking about having to buy three or four more trucks and hire having to hire four or five more people. So the recycling side is at this point, you know, to do that just is becomes a money thing, uh, you know, adding into the budget for it. So I'm uh, one of the things we were dealing with, especially now, or I shouldn't say now, but more pandemic, our recycling went up almost 30% the volume, our trash went up about 20. That's starting to come back down now for whatever reason, everybody kind of cleaned their houses out. So that's, I just wanted to give everybody kind of the treetop level of the four or five items that were were talked about. But obviously when we get to the next steps of this, you know, I, we can uh, delve into it a lot more, uh, especially some of the items the Councilor D Davila was talking about. Fantastic. More data again. He, you two. Uh, I got Sullivan data. and Signoli on it with the data, numbers. Data I got. Making my night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Russ, you are up. And and then technically Chris uh, had his hand up. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, I was just going to go through a bunch of the things that people had asked. So I'm Okay, good. perfect. So it's Russ and then open to others. Um, mindful that we have about 19 minutes left. In. I guess about um, 14 minutes of comments and then Councillor Davila will close this out. So we have Russ and then we have time for a couple more speakers if you want to get last topics. And Russ. Yeah, most of the trash and litter in the city is the responsibility of owners of property, whether they be residential, commercial, or industrial. Those owners have that responsibility. Uh, and I think we need to uh, educate all those owners. Uh, we could use one, one method would be to send part of the uh, Good Neighbor Handbook along with the quarterly tax bills that go out from the city to mm. property owners, property owners, not renters, uh, but property owners. Um, and th that would be one of the educational components that I think would be very helpful. To include with that is how to call, how to use 311 online. Using 311 online is not that simple. Uh, maybe it is for some people, but for, for others, it, others it is not. It's a little cumbersome. Uh, but but to how to use 311 online, along with that property owner responsibility information. Um, we were talking about uh, Route 91 a little bit and uh, East Columbus Avenue. Part of the trash on East Columbus is windblown trash that comes off of 91. And I think it would be helpful, it wouldn't hurt at least, to have no littering signs along Route 91. Route 91, where it enters uh, Springfield from the south and from the north, and maybe a couple of signs in between. There's no littering. Uh, maybe $500 fine for littering uh, on Route 91. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that would happen, but I think it would be helpful, particularly for uh, my favorite place, East Columbus Avenue. <laughs> so, um, I think that's, uh, I, I think there may be a problem too with housing court backlog. When we try to get owners to comply and they are, and they don't want to comply, I think Keith could tell us about what the backlog is in housing court uh, to get owners to comply. Thank you very much. Russ, great suggestions, uh, both on the, the littering sign. And I, I would love to, um, to the comment earlier made by, I believe it was uh, Director Sullivan about increasing the, the litter fine. I do think that could help, especially in key areas, but just generally, I think that helps. Um, and then uh, great distribution idea regarding the Good Neighbor Handbook. Um, put it out with the taxes because we all pay attention to that one. <laughs> Uh, and and with the three one one education, there's also a three one one app which I haven't yet used, but it's on my to do list. Um, I've usually just called it in, but as far as litter is concerned, I'm really loving the email based solution. Um, and so there's that. Um, Chris, I will take it back to you. See you I, I just wanted to add when we were talking about fines and for some people, and and as an example, uh, DPW doesn't issue a lot of fines. Uh, one of the fines that we do issue is plowing into the public way for snow. And I'm just going to use that as an example. If people do not pay that fine, 
the way that I'm going to say government, not the city of Springfield, the way government is set up, it doesn't become a burden to them for about three years. So if somebody's property gets a fine, and I, and I don't want to, I'm, I'm talking in generalities, a business, a, a property owner can ignore the fine and it doesn't become a big deal until it becomes a lien on their property. And for example, this year uh, in October, 2022, the fines that I issued in the winter of 18 and 19 were now becoming liens on properties. So they all get the letters and all of a sudden I get inundated with phone calls about you need to abate my fine, you need to reduce my fine or I'll pay my fine. But I, I, I not to speak for some of these people here, I think certain people who are in the system say, I just don't have to pay the fine because it's never going to become a burden for a while. And, you know, maybe something will happen between now and then. And it's the same thing with blighted properties. I know I deal with Lisa D'Souza, uh, who, you know, was taking all these property people to court. And you're talking, you know, three, four, five years down the road sometimes uh, before, you know, the slap in the face for some of these really big fines becomes a reality for some of, some of the, some of the uh, business and or property owners. Thank you for the reality check on the timeline there. Thank you. We uh, we have, oh, great, Christina A. Thank you. Hi, hi, I'm Chris Agnetti. Thank you for recognizing me. I think we've heard a lot of great things tonight, so I can I can pass over a lot. You know, I've heard a lot about code enforcement and the fines, and I, I just want to remind everybody that Springfield is a poor city, and I kept thinking that, you know, maybe the fourth time they could really up the fine, because we do have a lot of people who even the first fine can be um, can be really deadly. Uh, and then, um, you know, code enforcement, I live near the Trafton Gate of uh, Forest Park, and, you know, there's a triangle there, and I, when I first moved in about four years ago, I, it was just horrendous with trash and I was picking up trash every week and then I'd meet other people who were picking up trash in the same place every week and it seemed like with a handful of us, we were doing things. But, you know, I've got to say that keeping that triangle free of trash in the horticultural society deserves a lot of credit too for planting and putting some pots around there. Um, people just haven't been as bad, but I mean, you still have, you still have lots of nips, you know, dirty diapers, the, the fast food containers. And I just hear, you know, that people are supposed to keep, I don't live right next to the triangle, but I think of my neighbors who do live, you know, a few doors down from me and, you know, to ask them to be picking that up all the time is really unfair because for most of the people, you never get that volume or that frequency. And the people who live right near that triangle, you know, I see that they don't pick up the trash and I honestly can't blame them because they must feel like they're the work horses for the for the town or the city. So um, anyways, that's just something I wanted to mention that people who live next to the high litter areas, you know, I think they need to be cut some slack. Um, also, I thought that was a great idea about sending out um, notifications of um of different things on litter through the the um, the real estate taxes. I had been thinking the voter um, uh, registration, you know, to confirm that you're still you're still on the voting list. I want to give uh, high fives to the trash removal in the city. I think trash removal and recycling and yard collection. I think it's been awesome. The only thing I've noticed since we did touch on this subject is there doesn't seem to be a great place where we could bring our um, our batteries to. And if there is a place that we can go and recycle our batteries and drive to, um, I'd love to hear that at some point. Um, I think the, the uh, schools definitely are a place you know, after 9-11, the whole country took its waste bins out of the picture. And I think that's why we, I don't know, in my opinion, that's why we're in the litter uh, situation that we're in. And so I do think the idea of more um, litter baskets, especially the kind where you need to open them up to put something in and they're hard to put things in. I think, you know, if most people will put their litter into some sort of bin, if they don't have to carry it for 15 minutes and um, so that's already been covered, but I wanted to just say on schools, I remember I was eight in 1970 when they had that um, commercial all the time with the Native American and the canoe, you know, with the, the teardrop coming out of the eye, looking at the trash in his mm. beautiful lake. And um, I know as a kid, that was really um, 
just set me against littering. And, um, you know, there might be some sentimental eight-year-olds where if you start with that kind of program and getting it from that angle, that might be a great way to catch people. Um, and I'm glad that people are going to start focusing on cars on front lawns because I see a whole lot of that. And I, I, I you know, especially with this property valuation assessments come out and I, I see, you know, places where nobody's parking on their front lawns and me where I have a street where people park on their front lawns. And I just think if if people are going to start cutting back on that or, or making noises about that, I'm really um, psyched about it. The only place in the four years since I've lived in the city um, that really shouts out to me, and this isn't Forest Park, I think it's called Mason Square. They've got a um, they've got a, a park with the playground, and you look over a, a creek or some water, and it's almost like it's a dump when you look down. Because um, I'm still a walker, <laughs> I come from another city, and I, I'm what I think I'm one of the few um, Springfield folks who walks a lot because I see all the sidewalks that end and the no no side sidewalks when you come to rotaries and such but um that that's just a place that might even benefit from a camera so people would know you know we're watching you do not dump all this trash here and so quickly um that's from my list given what everybody else is saying have been shortened it and uh thank you so much for calling on me appreciate it thank you uh those were i love that you had come with basically an agenda. And I want to call out Beata Bolin, who is on the Springfield Garden Club. I know she had raised her hand a bit over there. So we have, a, if we could keep comments down a couple minutes each, Beata, then Chad. And if there's anyone else, you better get your hand up soon because we just have a little time left. Beata. Just very briefly, I do want to reiterate that, you know, this is a different hat. I, I am in the Garden Club and I have noticed that that tr that traff the triangle right outside of the Trafton entrance to Forest Park since the Springfield Garden Club has taken over, um, kind of planting different areas there. The neighborhood has really paid attention, and there's it, it's been my observation. And obviously, Christine, if you live there, you you know that there's less trash. So it just speaks to citizenship taking kind of ownership, um, and. If you, you know, if you, you take care of the, the, the terrace in front of your house, people are going to be less, in, you know, they're going to be less inclined to just dump something there because they consider it as, as, as something beautiful and that somebody cares about the neighborhood. And they're usually really grateful for that. So just that's my, my soapbox. I'm done with it. <laughs> <laughs> the Garden Club soapbox, which I love. And that goes back to what Keith O'Connor said earlier, which I'm looking forward to seeing the, the studies on that, that having... Flowers planted may reduce uh, litter, which sounds like anecdotally we're seeing here. All right. It looks like the last comment of the night will be from Officer Joseph. Hit it, Chad. Thanks. I'll be quick. Uh, one thing about the fines and, and, and ticketing, um, more often than not, the owner of the property gets ticketed. So we go with the Springfield GIS system, which anybody could access, and you find the actual owner of the property, and that's who gets the ticket, and they're not poor, generally. So trust me, they're more often than not, they live out of town and they're making a lot of money. OK, we all know the, the, the high cost of rent in this city these days. Um, so we are we do recognize, um, you know, the, the challenges people have with income in these neighborhoods. But more often than not, 99 percent of the time, those tickets go to someone who doesn't live in the city. They own that house. And so but, you know, so we're very cognizant of that. I That's a you know, and um the, the second real quick, I, I agree with the, the, it's called the broken window theory. You know, yep. one broken window on a street, then someone else is like, why should I keep up my windows? Mm -hmm. They don't fix their broken window. But if we keep everything fixed, you know, one person plants flowers, maybe the next will. But that goes on, you know, a lot of education and organizing streets, you know, like I said, get street teams. Um, you know, that's, that's a, you know, a, a more concerted effort but um all great ideas tonight thank you fantastic great way to wrap it up and councillor davila i will put it to you for the last five minutes thank you thank you eric uh, before I, I give out my my closing uh first of all i would uh, like to uh acknowledge erica the great job and the fantastic job that you have done today uh leading this group and uh and chairing this group so uh that's why i chose her 
She is. She has a lot of talent. And so, Erica, you have my gratitude, not only as a city councilor, but also as a resident. Uh, uh, you have my gratitude. Uh, absolutely wonderful job. I'm very happy. Um, great back and forth. The excellent, uh, uh, robust conversation. Uh, I have heard some wonderful ideas. What we're going to do, we're going to take all this information. We are going to process as a committee. Uh, we are going to debrief with the uh, with uh, with uh, department heads, and we are going to be putting out uh, recommendations uh, later on. I believe in March. That's the target. There's sometime in in, in March. Uh, uh, there has been, however, some items here that I think that could be some action could be taken. Uh, so. Uh, I, I am just like overwhelmed with the great, the great conversation and ideas. Uh, I have to say, Chris, that I am delighted. One of the things that I heard, one of the best things I heard all day in this whole meeting is that uh, we're going to be starting uh, to put single street dumpsters uh, throughout the city. Of course, Chris, uh, are you still there, Chris? Where's Chris? There you are. Chris, of course, I'm here. You will make me happier, my good friend, <laughs> if this program of the single stream dumpster stars in Forest Park at the X. Uh, it, it, we don't have dumpsters here. Uh, we mm -hmm. all know it's an issue with the X. We all know, I know you see it. Uh, I would be a very, very happy person if that were to happen. So I also, uh, something that we discussed, the single stream. And so I'm very happy, Chris. That's music mm -hmm. to my ear that that's gonna be happening. And I believe you said that's starting April, correct? Uh, yes. Yep. All right, excellent, excellent. And so I'm going to uh, wrap it up with this. I'm just going to reemphasize that it is my hope that we can develop <laughs> long standing solutions in cooperation with all involved, and that the solution that we develop together can be a blueprint for the whole city. Because this is a very important issue. It's an issue that affects the core, the pride of the city. And it's an issue that we have to get it right the first time. Uh, I remind all the viewers and uh, uh, on the media that uh, you could, right now, in partnership with Roca, you could call litter at Springfield, springfieldcityhall.com. That is litter at springfieldcityhall.com. You state where you have the issue with litter and they will come out and they will remove the litter. Um, it's a good program. It's a good start. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of wonderful solutions. And so um, thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. And stay tuned. There's more and more, more, more wonderful things coming to uh, not only Forest Park, but to the great city of Springfield. Thank you, everybody. And God bless. And Erica, I will let you join the meeting, ma'am. All right. Uh, I'm not going to do an emotion. I'm just going to say we're no, adjourned. Just, yeah, we're done. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay, <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good night.